Just going to read from uh, Genesis 47 while you're opening your Bibles. Um, We do have another chaplain amongst us. Um, Jennifer is uh, is a chaplain out at Esk and uh, been with us just for a little while. So um, just um, be upholding Jennifer as well. But we come to um, Genesis 47. I better put my glasses on. Look like an old man. I am an old man. First 12 verses of Genesis 47. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and brothers with their flocks and herds and everything they own have come from the land of Canaan and are now in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked the brothers... What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, We have come to live here a while because the famine is severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know of any among them with special ability, then put them in charge of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, but they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. And then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out of his presence. And so Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Rameses, or Goshen, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. As, uh, as some of you know, I grew up on a farm in the sandy soil of uh, the Mallee down in Victoria. Average rainfall of around 12 inches a year. So just 300 mil, and uh, drought is not uncommon. So not all of Victoria is green and lush. This photo was a paddock just across the road from our home at the beginning of the millennium drought. And a common occurrence was the dust storms during the, the droughts. Drought can be devastating. In the time of drought, drought can come for any one of us. Drought can come for you and I. When life seems hot, when it's dry, when it's unpleasant, when it's difficult and tough, when the blessings seem far away. So what should we do? Well, a farmer cannot make a living out of dust. And so a wise farmer will try to make hay while the sun shines to have supplies in reserve should the seasons turn bad. You and I, likewise, need to turn to God's word, God's refreshing word, dig deep into God's word, let it soak into our being. Let it be the the reservoir that we keep coming back to when it's hot and dry. As... Psalm 1 declares, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. God's word. Toward the end of the book of Genesis, here we are, and drought has come across the whole region in the Middle East. Jacob and his family in Canaan, are in diabolical trouble. 
He'd heard that Egypt had a good supply of grain and so he'd sent his boys down to Egypt to purchase grain and he'd sent them down a second time and it's during that second trip that Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. But Joseph knew through a dream of Pharaoh's that this drought is going to continue for another five years. So... Just over 3,000 years ago, this region was suffering a seven-year drought. Times haven't changed. A seven-year drought 3,000 years ago. Joseph knew that the best plan for his family was to pack up and leave Canaan and come to Egypt for him to be able to care for them, look after them. This, This was God's plan for their provision. And I'm sure initially that the brothers, Jacob, would have thought, can't we just stay here, stay in Canaan? We're settled here. And this, where we are settled, this is the promised land. This is the land that God has provided for his people, for us. God had told father, sorry, grandfather, Isaac and great grandfather Abraham, this is the land where you are to settle. This is the promised land. Surely God should provide for them there, shouldn't He? But God's ways are not our ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts than our thoughts. Often from our perspective, we think we know what God's plans are for us. But so often we're wrong. God doesn't do what we think he should do. God doesn't provide for us the way that we think that he'll provide for us. God disturbs us. God moves us. He shifts us. He leads us often into the unknown. Why? Often because God is attempting to lead us into a greater depth of faith in him, to trust him more. And ultimately God is less concerned about our circumstances, our preferences or comfort than he is about our faith in him. When God is the most important one in your life, then your circumstances matter little. And yet we get hung up so often on our circumstances, on our preferences. And as we read the story, it may appear to us that Joseph was taking things into his own hands. However, Pharaoh had previously agreed that Joseph's family should come to live in Egypt and that he would have them settle in the best part of the land. Go back to chapter 45, verse 18. And so here in chapter 47, we see Joseph taking time to go before Pharaoh, to come before Pharaoh, to honour him by approaching him a second time, allowing him to restate his previous directions for their provision. Joseph seeks to honour Pharaoh. Now, we don't know whether this particular pharaoh honoured God in any way at all. Most likely he didn't. But he certainly had great respect for Joseph. He had great faith in Joseph. He had placed Joseph in the, the position of prime minister over all of the people and the land. So what we see here is mutual honour and respect They both sought the best for one another, for their families, for the nation in general. And although Pharaoh worshipped a multitude of other gods and the sun god Ra, he had his mystical magicians, he undoubtedly lived rather ungodly life, Joseph gave him due and full respect. So how should you and I treat 
not just one another, but our neighbour, our workmate, the fellow student, the office girl. How should we treat them? With respect. How should we treat our Muslim, Buddhist or Aboriginal contacts? With respect. We may not agree with their beliefs and lifestyle, but we do need to respect them as being made in the image of God. And God loves every one of us. Some Christians... I think we tend to think that if others don't agree with us, then they don't respect us. Could that be because we don't respect those who have different beliefs or lifestyle to us? We don't actually respect them. Sadly, I think that often non-Christians are much more respectful of us than we are of them. Kev suggested before they might look at us and think we're a bit like a fruitcake. This tells us otherwise. McCrindle Research has recently revealed that 92% of Aussies know a Christian and they describe them, describe us, describe Christians as caring, loving, kind, honest and faithful. So, Christians in Australia are known to be caring, loving, faithful, honest. 92% of Aussies therefore respect you, respect Christians, because you are loving, honest, faithful. They don't, they're not wary, they're not necessarily sceptical or suspicious of us. They don't hate us. More likely, they just don't understand us. And so that should take away our reluctance and our fear of talking about our faith with them. 92% of Aussies know a Christian and describe us as caring, loving, kind, faithful, honest people. They respect us. Do we respect those who hold different beliefs or lifestyle to us? And so Joseph respects Pharaoh and he honours him. He honours the one who God has placed in authority over him. Do we respect and honour those that God has placed in authority over us? Do we seek to bless them, to do good to them, to pray for them? So we come back to our reading, verse 1. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father, brothers, their flocks, their herds, everything they own have, have come from the land of Canaan. They're now in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked the brothers, What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, we have come to live here for a while because the famine is severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Joseph, settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen And if you have know of any of them who have special ability, then put them in charge of my own livestock. So Joseph's family have arrived. They've taken up, they're camping really, they're camped in Goshen. And there's a list in chapter 46 of the family, 70 all up, not including the names of the daughter-in-laws. So this is a significant number of people camped in Goshen. Joseph brings five of his brothers into the court of Pharaoh to introduce them, to show their respect, to express their gratitude. 
But they also declare that they are Pharaoh's servants. And there's no sense of entitlement. They come in humility before Pharaoh. What a difference to our culture today. We are constantly soaked, we're marinated, if you like, in an environment that says you are entitled to whatever you desire. That's our world today. You are entitled to free medical care, to a roof over your head, to enjoy a peaceful neighbourhood, or, if you so choose, to rock that party as loud as you like. So you're entitled to peace or party, You're entitled to a parking spot close to the shop, entitled to driving without anyone disrupting you, thank you very much, entitled to clear drinking water straight out of the tap. Most places around the world that's not the case. We think we're entitled to cheap medications, entitled to be on the dole and not work if I so desire. We're entitled to whatever we want. However we want. This is the age of entitlement where gratitude and humility are frequently missing. And we get drawn into that. Frequently, we're, we're not very grateful and we're not very humble. Joseph had advised his brothers prior to their meeting with Pharaoh that they should not hide their occupation. Go back to 46, chapter 46, verse 33. When Pharaoh calls you and asks you, what is your occupation? He knew that Pharaoh would do that. Because Pharaoh's not just going to let anybody live in his land. He's, he's going to go, how can you benefit the country? What is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock, From our youth until now, both we and our fathers before us. Then you'll be able to live separately and securely in the land of Goshen. Why? Because every shepherd is repulsive to the Egyptians. The Egyptians hated shepherds. Goshen was an area in the delta region of the mighty Nile River. It's on the Israeli side. It's well watered. It's fertile. Yet it is away from the centre of Egypt's activity. And so in the providential hand of God, they would be able to settle in some of the best land that Egypt has to offer and they would be quite separate and secure over the other side of the Nile River. They'd be left alone by the general population because they saw shepherds as the lowest of the low. We're not going to associate with them. In fact, some of the Egyptians are so pleased to have them arrive. Why? Because now they don't have to look after Pharaoh's herds. Fantastic. How good is that? They move. All of Joseph's family move and all of their herds and their flocks, they're facing starvation in Canaan to settle in peace and prosperity. Safe and secure. We move into verse 7. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. I don't know whether you've seen anyone who's 130 lately, but um, Jacob was also a shepherd out under the elements for the last 130 years. He'd also suffered grief for the last 130 years. He looks old. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of my pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. And so Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them them property in the best part of the land. 
the district of Ramesses or Goshen, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their children. Just want to highlight two points. Firstly, Jacob blesses Pharaoh not once but twice. Jacob blesses the leader of a foreign country who worships a multitude of foreign gods, false gods. Not once, but twice. Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to them, bless them and pray for them. Can we bless those who don't believe what we believe? Who live differently to the way that we live? Who can you bless this week? Someone who you wouldn't normally bless. Secondly, Jacob says, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. Jacob recognises life as a journey or an expedition, not as a, a state of permanence and finality. And he acknowledges that they have not been pleasing years. The years may have been unpleasant, may have been difficult, tough, filled with grief for Jacob. In one sense, 130 years of drought. Yet the hand of God was upon him and now, at this point, he goes on to enjoy another 17 years of peace and prosperity in a foreign land until he dies. Obedience led to blessing. Now, nowhere does God promise us that this life will be trouble-free. Rather, Jesus said, you will have trouble, but be of great courage, for I have overcome the world. He said this in John 16.33, and this is the amplified version. I have told you these things so that in me, in Christ, in Christ you may have perfect peace. In the world you have, you do have tribulation and distress and suffering but be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, steadfast, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. In spite of the tribulation, in spite of the drought, the distress, the suffering, you can have, you can know perfect peace as we rest in Christ. God doesn't promise us that this life will be trouble-free, but he does promise that obedience will lead to blessing. And he does promise us perfect peace. And so as we consider the story of Joseph and his family, think of the bigger picture again, I guess. We might ask, why didn't God just stop the drought? Why didn't God send rain to Canaan, at least, if not to everywhere else? Why not send rain to Canaan and allow the Hebrew people to stay in the promised land? Doesn't that seem logical? This is the promised land. Why send them away? Human logic would question the wisdom of God. Why doesn't God step in and remove the cancer? Or the bully at school? Why doesn't God just send the rains? Why doesn't he turn back the flood or the bushfire? Why doesn't he just fix the problem? I can only presume that had he not sent the people all the way to Egypt, where they would then remain separate from their neighbours, 
Had they remained in Canaan, they would have intermarried with the surrounding people groups just as they went and did later on anyway. And they would have learnt to worship their false gods. This is God building his nation and providing, as, as the story unfolds, as we continue to read the Old Testament, further opportunities for God in the years to come to reveal himself and his ways to them, to rescue them, to redeem them, to, to reveal his heart to them, to provide them for them as they wandered through the desert to give them the law, to reveal again his heart and his ways. And so often we don't understand why God is doing what he's doing or he's allowing what he's allowing. But God has never stopped revealing himself to us, revealing his heart and his ways. God does promise to be with us, to bless us, to provide for us, to protect protect us. The heart of God is such that he will always provide for his people. And if Pharaoh cared for these foreigners, these weirdos, fruitcakes from Canaan, if Pharaoh cared for them, how much more will our Heavenly Father care for you and I, his children? How much more? He is a good and faithful Father. I trust that when the times of drought come for you, that you will always see, you will always acknowledge, always appreciate the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. And ultimately, Our obedience will lead us into the eternal promised land in glory. Hence, I look forward to dying. Our obedience will lead us into the eternal promised land. Amen? Amen. So is he your God? If not, then accept his forgiveness, his saving grace. Place Jesus as Lord of your life. And if he is your God, then serve him faithfully and obediently. Walk with him. So let's stand as we close our our time together and sing of our appreciation, our, our great God who is so good, who is so faithful.